Uh, we are so pleased to have Nolan Crabb, who is the Director of uh, Technology for the Americans with Disabilities program there at Ohio State University. Uh, hi, Nolan. Hello, how are you? My apologies for the earbud thing. Here. Okay, you're going to get your earbud in. Myself. Okay. And Mike Thompson, who's the director of the, uh, of the studio here at Rio Grande, is coming back. He was doing his directorial <laughs> We're a little short-handed, so I was <laughs> doing yeah. some behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah. Right, it right. happened. So um, anyway, we will be talking about uh, assistance or, or service dogs today. Uh, Nolan has a service dog and uh, is there with him, obviously. Uh, yeah. And um, so we'll start this off. Uh, Nolan, could you tell the audience a little bit about your job and a little bit about your dog and the uh, ways that your dog uh, uh, helps you and, 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 and partners with you throughout the day? Oh, uh, there's, there's, that's such a rich question, and I'll try to be as brief as I can. Uh, my job is, first of all, a uh, one of the best and most magnificent ones anyone could hope to have. I, I deal with technology and people, not in that order. And so we provide training and software and hardware to faculty members and staff who, again, either who, who achieve either a permanent or a temporary disability. And we can go into that person to his office or her office and provide the individual with technology that enables them to stay on the job and continue to work even though this new event has happened to them and uh, it's just a lot of a lot of fun the evaluations are always fascinating and the, the the people themselves are great to to work with by and large they're many times a little concerned a little afraid because they've never had this kind of experience happen to them before and uh, when we can go in and show them that there are techniques and and software programs that enable them to do what they used to do, albeit perhaps a little differently, uh, that makes the world uh, a changed place for them. So it's a, it's a great experience that way. Plus the work environment here in my judgment is just top flight. I would say that anywhere even if I weren't sitting in my chair at my office. So uh, <laughs> those two things combine to make it a great place. Uh, the service dog, the guide dog in this case, his name is Carl with a C and he was so named by the school from whence he graduated that means that he was one of the uh, relatively early born dogs in the year in which he was born so they that particular school alphabetizes the names of their dogs so if you get a a sea dog you can you can tell he was born in the early relatively early part of the year so and in the, indeed carl's birthday is in may so uh, he's not quite three he is a uh, purebred black lab and uh, he's he's delighted to be with he's he's got an amazing little personality when I asked for when I went to get him a uh, year and three months ago now mm. uh, one of the things I asked for was a dog that really had a little bit of spine a little bit of uh, you know uh, sort of a no limits extreme sports kind of mentality I don't do those kind of things you can tell by looking at me that I'm tend to, to not be all that uh, active at this point but I wanted a dog who could get out and really stretch it out and eat up the sidewalk and and move in the event that we we wanted to do those things so he provides uh, guidance from point A to point B whether it's from my building to a bus stop my building to another building on campus um, or just uh, you know in my neighborhood from the bus stop to the house etc uh, he's there to make sure that we get there in one piece as it were and get there relatively safely he does not take charge of the routes he doesn't know when the lights have changed so you can't rely on Carl to know when it's a, a green light that's you can't uh, he can't do those things um, but he is able to provide what's called intelligent disobedience so if that hybrid car is coming at us and we're in a in a, the crosswalk chances are high that Carl will stop and not allow us to cross even if I can't hear that car and uh, that's that's a huge, a huge blessing as you might well imagine and that's one of the things that he's trained to uh, to do is to judge the safety of that intersection and if he believes that it's relatively safe to go ahead and cross he will he will do that well, you'd mentioned uh, 
a, a, a new uh, 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 challenge that uh, Carl has, and that's uh, people who are walking and, and texting and paying no yeah. attention to their surroundings. Yeah. Well, that's huge, believe it or not. It's, uh, it's, it happens a lot, and, and so it becomes up to him to determine how to engage in people avoidance. <laughs> and um, he was trained in many instances for many days he was trained in the streets of Manhattan and so when he comes to OSU he kind of looks at that as you know this is kind of cake I've I've done this crowd avoidance stuff um, if you can do Manhattan you can pretty much do whatever comes at you at OSU and he is actually quite one of the things that I've come to appreciate about him is that he's quite good at at helping us avoid collisions with people and that's great on this campus because you'll have skateboarders, you'll have, as you say, students oh, yeah. who are texting, and, um, and the bicyclist may be right on you before you hear the bike, and he's really good at sort of evading the bike. <laughs> so he can so see where they're going, huh? Exactly, and that's, okay. that's huge. I helpful. have problems with that, and I can see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, well, how many? Where do, go I was going to ask where where do these dogs come from? Are they bred uh, specifically for this? <clears throat> they, in, in many instances, they are. There are oh, twelve to fifteen guide dog schools in the United States. There are more service dog schools. I'm deliberately creating a difference for your viewers so that they. There is a bit of a difference uh, in terms of the jobs they do. By the under the law, a guide dog is still considered a service dog, quote unquote. But um, but a service dog isn't necessarily a guide dog. I don't want to confuse everybody, but very quickly, a service dog may perform a task such as um, alerting a a deaf handler to the fact that the doorbell has rung, um, where. But, he, but that dog probably isn't trained to guide someone safely across an intersection. Now, the guide dog is not necessarily going to be able to alert me to the doorbell, nor does he need to in my case. Um, so there is, a, there is a difference between the two. Short answer to your question, there are probably between 12 and 15 guide dog schools in the United States. Um, some of them are just like any other organization. Some of them are pretty top tier. Others are, are less so in some respects. Um, and uh, and this this particular school that Carl graduated from has its own breeding program, and they engage in all kinds of interesting exercises, including frozen embryos and uh, all kinds of exchanges with other schools like that, the frozen embryo exchanges and so on, to to really get the best, most qualified dog they can possibly get, uh, and um, they do a great job up there of, of breeding these guys with just the right amount of temperament, the right amount of drive because you need a guide dog that has some drive. You want a dog that's curious about his world. Otherwise, the guide work is going to be either sloppy or non-existent. So that breeding is, is crucial, and it's an important part of this. I guess most of them will be fairly large because they got to push you around a little bit, and they're not chihuahuas yeah, and dachshunds. That's, no, you're absolutely correct. Good point. Uh, yeah. you, 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 no, there, there are so many breeds that are, are in use, predominantly Labradors, um, some Golden Retrievers, some Poodles, the hmm. large size, regular size poodles. Mm -hmm. uh, two folks who have allergies to uh, dander. Um, German shepherds still get used by some of the schools, not quite to the degree that they once did, um, but uh, almost ex not exclusively, but largely Labradors, black, yellow, etc. So, what can he do around the house? He's actually just a dog. Uh, at home, he could, the harness is off, and he's totally off duty. And he can play with chew toys and play tug of war and That's get in my question. face and try to, you know, beg for food. You know, the typical dog silliness. Right. And that's exactly what you want. You, the last thing you want to do is burn these guys out. They have a working life of anywhere between, let's say, six and ten years. And you really want to preserve that working life for as long as you can. It costs about $50,000 to train one of these guys from birth to graduation. And so you obviously want that investment to last as long as you possibly can. So when he's at home and, and off, off the harness, uh, at that point he can be just himself. And, uh, and that's, that's huge. That's really crucial. Okay, say if you're out and about mm -hmm. and, you know, he's tending to your needs. How about when mm -hmm. he has uh, his needs? Well, what if he, if he has, it needs to go unexpectedly. Right. It's not quite on schedule. Um, we rarely have had that experience. It's, 
believe it or not, he, he's on an eating schedule and he's given that helps. only a certain kinds of food. And so it's rare that we have, but when that happens, he will signal that, hey, I got to pull over. And he will tug on that harness a little bit toward the grass. Uh -huh. And that'll give you the clue, okay, we'll, we'll do this. And you step to the grass, remove the harness because you don't ever want the dog to get the idea that it's okay to uh, take care of his business in harness. That's oh. a bad message. Okay. So you re That's... remove that harness, and then when he's done, you obviously, if you need to clean up after him, you do that. And these dogs are trained to let you touch their back as they are doing their thing. So the blind person can actually tell what's going on with that dog. Yeah. And they don't shy away from being touched. Right. Um, well, you need to know where to be able to find it. Yeah. You do indeed. <laughs> and yeah. not step in. Stop. You know. I wouldn't want to be like feeling <laughs> yeah, all <right>. right. <laughs> You do need to know exactly where you're going. I, uh, I wish someone would develop an infrared uh, sensor or a heat sensor for my <laughs> iPhone that I could just beep, kind of beep, point beep. at the ground so I would be able to find it even more quickly that way. But <laughs> yeah. So right. far, no go. That's a good idea. But yeah, so quick answer to your question is he does give you a signal. He will let you know. And as soon as you're done, you harness back up and carry on. So. Yeah. I think you bring up a, a really good point that <coughs> the, uh, the person that owns this dog uh, has to have some uh, <clears throat> training, himself. training themselves Absolutely. And, and, and provide Absolutely. A, a real stable, predictable environment as much as you can in terms of Absolutely. feeding schedule and, and that kind of thing. I think that this whole... The, the success of this whole process, <clears throat> pardon me, the success of this whole process hangs really on two pillars, consistency and love. Uh -huh. And and if you are uh, someone who is consistent with regard to the uh, the routines and the discipline when it's necessary, and if you're, if you're one who gives love and is able to make sure that dog knows it's loved, you will be able to accomplish uh, al almost anything that needs to be done. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a limitless world out there when you yeah. employ those those two things. They're they're working because of their connection with you, not because of a reward by reward basis. They're, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Yes, they love the food in the food pouch, which I always carry with me. Mm -hmm. And when when he does something well, he gets a yes. I will say the word yes, and then he'll get a, a food reward for that, and then we'll do additional praise. But it's that human additional praise that. That's the currency in which he really trades. Yeah, yeah. You do, we'll, we'll talk at a later program about yes and markers and the type sure. of training that characterizes uh, sure. modern service dog training and other training. I, I went to the Karen Pryor Academy, yes. and this is a, a, an animal training, uh, science-based animal training <clears throat> institute that uh, uh, started out with marine mammals, by and large, many other people. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, tasks we were given uh, as an assignment was to Put, uh, to establish a, a, a training s sequence of steps for uh, a dog that provided a hearing alert to a person who uh, has a hearing limitation uh, there. So, you know, the doorbell, you know. So mm -hmm. that was a, an interesting task, made you, made you think. So mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you, uh, when you, when you're at home, and like Mike was saying, you know, if you happen to drop something, you know, where's the, well, like all of us, where's the remote? Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he's he's not trained to find things like that. Okay, right, right. Some schools do train a yeah. fetch or a, you know, but this particular school has decided that that's just that's a lot of intensive effort. Uh-huh. And so they don't they don't train their this yeah. particular school doesn't train for fetch. Yeah, right. Put your uh, put your remote where you where you know it is, right? Yeah, that's okay. pretty much what you have to do. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, that makes so sense. So his his training is just basically to lead you on a safe path when you're Correct. outside the house. Correct. He understands forward, left, right, and then there's another command that's kind of crucial, and that's wait. And that's the command you give before you drop the harness. If you just drop that harness handle, that's a, and then issue a, a, some discipline, that's equivalent to calling you by all of your names, like your mama used to do when you knew that the next uh, hmm. two seconds were going to be trouble. Right. Um, so you do issue a wait command and then put the harness handle down so that he knows he's not in trouble, but that you need to, to stop or whatever you need to do. So yeah, okay. forward, right, left. Uh, and you can issue some other general commands such as find the door. And he will look. If he can see a door, he will guide you to that door in that building. Find the steps to the steps. That's the command this particular school uses. Um, and you can teach other 
skills like to the elevator. If he can see something that looks like an elevator set of doors, he'll go to those. So, yeah. I can imagine trying <coughs> to have my dogs do that, and then they see a squirrel or a cat. Well, they those have to be highly happen. disciplined. <laughs> yeah, it's... those distractions definitely happen out on the road, and there are things you can do to, to mitigate that a little bit. We do what's called a redirection. In the old days, back when I say the 90s, when I got my first guide dog, we engaged in a lot of what we call yank and yell, which meant you drop the harness and you tug that leash and you say no and you get really stern when, when little Fido takes off after the squirrel. Nowadays, we do it in a much better way. Um, we, once we re and you can tell when your dog's distracted, by the way. They breathe funny under the harness. They, their guide work starts to go, go goofy. It just if you've done it with them for more than a couple seconds, you know immediately. Uh oh, we've got a, a problem. He's no longer guiding me. He is is totally distracted. So you redirect that behavior. You issue a, a touch command, which puts his his face on your on your fist, and then you hit him with a food reward. And you may have to do that four or five times in order to really redirect behavior away from that distraction, and back to you. But it's a great system and it works really well. Get him back with you. I, I, when I was in the Karen Pryor program, one of the first things we learned was, you know, the touch cue, and uh, yes. you can use that when your dog's at the vet and a little yes. anxious, kind of get the dog focused on you. Or yes. My, yeah. my dog it's... was quite reactive and spent uh, two years in a shelter, a um, mm. long time in a shelter anyway. So when I, he, went, he went with me to my workplace uh, and uh, on an elevator, you know, it was mm -hmm. crowded, so I give him, you know, ask him to touch, you know, touch, yes. touch, yes. and get him focused back on me, <clears> and you know, and get him mm -hmm. in the thinking part of his brain again. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's exactly what redirection does. Yeah, it it gets okay. them focused back on where they need to be. Speaking of on uh, distractions, <clears throat> uh, I know whenever I'm in a crowd with my dogs, and they're not, you know, trained like that. But uh, I always have people coming up and wanting to pet them, or they just walk up and pet them. How, how what do you, have you experienced, and how should people react to these dogs? Really good question. It's really always best to ask the handler. Always, always is may my son, my daughter pet your dog. May I pet your dog? Yeah, uh, it's so wrong to just walk up and arbitrarily start playing with the dog because it becomes a safety issue. I know it sounds like I'm being mean and hateful when I say, no, he's in harness. You can't pet him right now. They, they interpret that as me being some sort of stuck up, whatever. But it's really a safety issue. Quick example. Let's say you and Carl make friends. You're now good friends. And if he sees you across the street one day, a week later, he's going to totally forget to do the guide work. And it's going to be, hey, there's my friend Mike yeah. or my friend Tom over and there. And I yell at him, hey, Carl, how you doing? I'm going to go find him. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, and then next thing you know, the guide work is gone, because he's tearing you, dragging you across the street to see his new friend. So there are reasons why we really discourage people playing with these guys in harness. Um, there are exceptions. Obviously, you're going to make it on a case by case basis. Um, I worked in D.C. many years ago, and one of the folks who shared an elevator with me was General Al Haig, huh. the former Secretary of State under Reagan, and. Um, and one day he reached out and petted my dog's head. Well, you don't, you don't tell Al Haig not to do something, <laughs> you know? It's okay if he wants to touch my dog. And he proceeded to tell me how much he loved labs, which was an interesting side of, of a rather stern kind of guy that you see. At least that was his image on television, very stern. But he had a, a love for labs that was uh, impressive. And uh, so, yeah, there are case-by-case -case situations, you, and you make those. But by and large always ask it's just best Nolan as as we're moving toward wrapping up here and this has been a yeah. wonderful program thank you so much you. Mike and I'm sure both look forward to uh, doing these kinds of programs with you in the future uh, it's such an education for the public well I, I appreciate the chance to be here I I would just plead with your your viewers to keep in mind the fact that you know a, a service dog really is a legitimate animal and it has a purpose and it's it's so so difficult and so wrong to take your own pet and have it pretend that it's a some kind of a service dog. It's kind of an insult to the disabled user who really needs their that dog for a legitimate purpose. Do we have time for me to try to bring Carl out and bring the yes, microphone please. down to his level? And let me hurry and see if we can do this. Carl, come.
Let's go, buddy. He's down here half asleep. Come on. Come here. Okay, I'm going to try to move this camera, and I apologize for... Well, we'll, we'll uh, help you out with it. I'm turning it slowly. If I, right. Sorry if I'm making anybody dizzy. We're coming around. There's Oop. Carl's, the top of Carl's head. Hang on. He's trying to lick the iPad. That's All our right. problem here. There, there are some of Carl's eyes. Oh, sorry. Carl's tail. Back up, back up, back up. <laughs> How, do I need to go down? Up? Yes. Down, yeah, straight down. down. Okay. There's okay. Carl's back end. There's Carl's nose. <laughs> Well, this is not going to work, obviously. All right. Well, we, we, got, a, could, we got kind of a look. Least, Carl has beautiful eyes. <laughs> Sorry. And then his harness is here, and, and so oh, now he's ready to go. He thinks we're going somewhere. Oh, okay. He's ready All right, up. buddy. Okay. Let me turn this back around. And, All right. Coming around. My apologies. There you are. For, and go down. You got it. Ugh. You got it. Okay. We're so back. when he needs care, I know it probably wouldn't be a great thing to have. I've got a Bernese Mountain Dog, which is... Very long hair and lots of it, but uh, his care, would you take Super. him to a groomer to, uh, you know, for bathing and all that sort of thing? Yeah, we try to groom him. I use a, something called a Furminator. Okay. And we, we brush him out every day and give him a bath every few months and, uh, you know, just make sure that he's able to, to go in public and appear reasonably well. Yeah. Well, down to the last four minutes here. Can you tell us, uh, uh, from uh, talking to the uh, director of uh, AD, AD on campus there, how many, mm -hmm. how many, assist, how many service dogs? Because there's a difference. Service dog is right. a there's a specific definition for a service dog, not just a dog that someone wants to have with them, but uh, they're trained right. to do a task. That's correct. They provide a specific service. Yes. Um, um, Scott Listener, who is the director of, who is the ADA coordinator here. Uh, Scott estimates that there are roughly 12 or so service dogs on the campus, which is a pretty small number when you factor in that, you know, you're 60,000 students and 40,000 right. employees, give or take. Um, so roughly 12 service dogs. And, of course, there are a great deal more if you look at dogs in training who visit the campus as part of their training or uh, dogs who, you know, uh, emotional support animals, the, that number is going to increase. But... Uh, specifically to service dogs, it's right around a dozen or so. Are, are these think. all uh, 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 guide dogs, or are there no, other? No, they're not. There, there are several different other services. We have lots of vets who, or some vets who have uh, dogs that alert them to uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, things of that nature. And um, any diabetic I, alert uh, dogs on uh, campus? I'm not certain of that i i don't we didn't break it down yeah to that degree i don't know well it's uh, interesting the 12 dogs and mm -hmm. and some for vets and yes. uh you know but that's not including the ones that are just with you for anxiety control right that's very different from a service dog yeah that's not the same classification and um and the the you know there are certain places that the the emotional support animal may not be able to go that the service dog can um, so, well, that'll be a great one to get into. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, that's a whole yeah, different game. Yeah, because uh -huh. a service dog is allowed to accompany you to what kinds of places? Pretty much, pretty much anywhere that you you can think of going. There, clearly, we don't want to take them into a super sterile environment in the medical center, for example. Um, you may want to avoid uh, research facilities where they're looking at diseases among other animals. You just have to use some common sense. But my goodness, any other place, uh, everywhere from Sam's Club to, uh, to uh, well, I don't know, anywhere on the university campus pretty much, um, you can take a, a service dog with you. Certainly restaurants, um, uh, inside of Uber cars and taxi cabs, things of that nature, they're required to carry the service dog with the, the handler. Um, so there's a, there's a long list of places you can go. Yeah, when I lived in Germany, they didn't have a problem with having dogs at restaurants. No, that was that's normal. Yeah, right. I yeah know, that's that was pretty cool. Yeah. that's just common for everybody, yeah. and that's I, I'm I like the idea, except that sometimes if that dog's not under really good control of the handler, that can create some real problems for a service dog. And so right, I, I, right. Yeah, you got a, a kid emotions. next door to you and a high chair that's flinging food everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's always fun.
Well, well, maybe in the further programs we can talk about uh, sure. the kind of sure. modern training methods that sure. uh, be, you've used with Carl fun. and uh, yeah. so forth yeah. and what difference that's made with training service animals. That'd and be we're great down fun. to 20 seconds here. So anything yeah. you want to add in before we, before we close? I'll ask a couple of words there for... I'm just honored to have been part of this. I want to thank you and, uh, and everyone else behind the scenes who made this possible. It's been a pleasure to be part of it. Well, okay. Thank you we so thank much. We thank you. Yeah. So look forward to the next time. Yep, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thanks for watching Positive Partners, and we'll see you next month. Have we sufficiently...